At Garrett Wade, we believe you should enjoy the tools you use in your garden as much as you do your garden. You work hard to keep your garden looking good. Let Garrett Wade help. We travel the world looking for the right tool, one that provides a lifetime of value at the right price. Whether it's a third generation family business in Germany, a small regional maker in Italy, or laminated steel blades from Japan, we have what you want, built to be used today, and passed down for others at a price that doesn't break the bank. To see our full collection, visit www.garrettwade.com. That's G A R R E T T W A D E dot com. And for a limited time, all listeners will receive free shipping on any order of $65 or more. To redeem, type in the code PLANTS20 at checkout to receive your special offer. Shop now to get started on your latest gardening project, knowing you have selected the right tools for the job. Garrett Wade tools are all backed by our guarantee. Use them for 90 days, and if a tool doesn't perform as we promise, send it back, no questions asked. Hello and welcome to another episode of Let's Argue About Plants, the podcast for people who love plants. Just not always the same ones. I'm Steve Aiken, the editor of Fine Gardening Magazine. And I'm Danielle Sherry. I am the senior editor, I almost forgot that, of Fine Gardening Magazine. (laughs) I haven't been in the office in a while. I know. Where am I? What's happening? Oh my gosh. Well, so we're recording remotely again um, here in the era of hashtag the new normal. And uh, it's not stopping us, though, is it, Steve? Uh, no, you wouldn't let me. So <laughs> he tried really hard to get out of doing this podcast. <laughs> I just want it. I want it noted. Um, so today the topic is, "Holy cow, it came back!" And your thoughts on this are, Steve? Uh, I'm 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 against it. I don't. Uh, <laughs> I'm not in the the proper frame of mind for this topic. Um, all I can think about is what didn't come back. Um, it's been, it's, it's not a good, it's not a good year for me, Danielle. It's, uh, I discovered an attack of the voles, um, <gasps> this year. And, um, all I can think about is the, the ones that I've lost and I lost quite a bit and, um, they devastated my, my front bed and then they moved up the side and they, they just attacked so many things. Um, oh these little rodents gosh. are just, they're shameless and, um, yeah. But, They're uh, terrible. Well, you know, yeah. I've battled them for years and years. And somebody had said to me that it's going to be a particularly bad year for us here in Connecticut because we basically didn't have a winter. So when it's been a really warm winter, they tend to their populations exponentially, I guess, get bigger. So, uh, yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's um, I, I lost I lost a lot. And uh, so if you, if you hear the sounds of weeping, you know, throughout this this podcast, it's uh, it's I'm remembering my forgotten soldiers. But, you know, it's it's also a weird year because I have a lot of things coming back that that are strange. I've had these uh, about six or seven years ago. I planted these daffodils, you know, or sorry, um, tulips. And, you know, like tulips do, they bloomed one year and then the next year Nothing. it was just foliage. And it's just been foliage ever since then. And I keep trying to, to rip off the foliage so that the bulb has no energy and it dies. And But that's not working. The foliage just keeps coming back. And then this year, I have uh, I have blooms on these tulips. Um, I'm waiting for them to open. Uh, but they have never shot up um, blooms in the past, you know, ever since the first year they were, they were planted. Um, and it's not that anybody comes along and eats them. You know, there are no stalks that are that are chopped off. They just do not produce flowers. And all of a sudden this year they're producing flowers. That is so weird because if you've been chopping off the foliage, usually what they say is that's the worst thing you could possibly do. And right? the bulb should actually die and not get any energy. It shouldn't do the opposite. It shouldn't reward you for your bad behavior. Well, I can remember a couple of weeks ago, like, you know, looking at this bed and saying, what is it going to take to get rid of you damn tulips? <laughs> and uh and, and now they've got uh they've got all these these flowers ready to open i have no idea what they're going to look like because I, I don't remember but so, so that's it, crazy it, it, yeah it's a weird year that is a re- weird year so okay other than these strange 
they don't know what the heck's going on tulips. What else were you surprised about that came back that you were super psyched about? Let's focus on the positive. We yes. could use that. The, the survivors. Um, <laughs> so, you know, one thing I was really surprised that came back was uh, this, this Bezia that I have, Bezia uh, Delta Phyla. Um, which is just, it's a, it's a wonderful plant. I see it all the time in the Pacific Northwest. And every time, um, I see it, 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 it steals my heart. Um, it's, uh, it's got these heart shaped, uh, leaves to these small heart shaped leaves, um, that are deep green modeled with a little purple. Um, and then, you know, they, uh, they get some flowers on them in, in, uh, in early summer, uh, just a moody, uh, great plant for shade, um, gets, I think it's supposed to get to about foot tall, but you know, minor, minor half that. Um, but they, I have it in a spot that's a little too dry for them. I think they want it moist. Um, this mm-hmm. is why you see them uh, normally in the Pacific Northwest. Um, this is in dry shade, and it's also duking it out with this. Um, I think it's a native carex, but it's this. It's re- this sp- nice spreading carex, which um, uh, which I kind of like, and it keeps um, muscling into the Bezia's territory. So uh, I already lost one bezia. It didn't, it didn't come back. So um, this year I really had no hopes and, and uh, you know, w- w- well, when I uncovered it and I saw the sprouts coming up, I was so excited. Um, I said, I said, bezia. And, uh, <laughs> and my family thought I was, I was, I said bees and they all darted in different directions <laughs> heading for cover. Um, but uh, no, the bezia came back and uh, I'm just, I'm, I'm thrilled about it. Um, now, what, is it, what does it look like when it came back? Because out in the Pacific Northwest, the few times I've seen this, it's evergreen. It's an evergreen perennial for them. So does it kind of do out here what like an epimedium does, that the old leaves look a little rank and there's new stuff coming up? Or is it just well, that, all new? I, that's what it had been in the past, but there, there were no leaves left. And now I just have like these little shoots coming up, you know, and starting ah. to unfurl. Um so just just enough to give me hope, and I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to move it to a spot that gets um, a little more moisture um, okay. to see how see how it does. So uh, I'll probably be talking about it again next year. And then I'm surprised it came back because I moved it and then and then didn't take care of it. Um, so I'll be surprised again if it comes back. That's so cool. All right, mm-hmm. that you know I've always wondered about the actual hardiness of that plant. So I'm going to have to add that to my list. I really like it. It's a really really good looking plant. I think if you can give it the moisture, it can take zone six. It's zone six to nine is what it's rated, but... uh, Okay. Yeah. All right. Good to know. Good to know. All right. So this is something that actually I'm going to talk about this plant and then I want to hear how yours is doing. So holy cow, it came back for me was uh, I had gotten a seedling from my stepfather, Ed, of a weeping Japanese snowbell, which is Styrex japonica pendula. And uh, he's been nurturing with care all of these seedlings of this small tree. And I finally took possession of one of his precious seedlings this year or last year, excuse me. And uh, it's this really, really cool small tree. It's got, it's zones five to nine. So I'm in the hardiness zone. It's no problem there. And it kind of gets eight to 12 feet tall and wide, but it's got this kind of bonsai-ish looking shape with these zigzag branches. Tiny little... Uh, green leaves to it. And then in the spring, usually around Mother's Day here for us in New England, it gets covered with these bell, white bell-like flowers. They've got this really cool yellow stamen in the middle of them, and the tree is just on fire. And then it's fragrant, which is awesome. So I love this tree. It's a choice tree. It's a specimen. So, but when I got it, it was basically bare root. And I'm not good with bare root. Um, So I dug it. I chucked it in a really inopportune spot right down my front steps. So had I been shoveling a ton of snow this year and piling it off to the side, I probably would have broken this thing to pieces because I totally forgot that I put it there. But uh, I noticed the other day, little green buds all over it. It totally made it. And uh, I'm psyched. Uh, It's it's a great small little tree. And uh, yeah. So full sun to partial shade, well-drained soil. So I gave it all of that. I just put it in a really bad spot. And lucky for me, we didn't get eight eight tons of snow this year. But I'm pretty sure I gave you a seedling too. One of Ed's precious seedlings. How did that work out for you, Steve? 
Is there any way I can get out of answering this question? <laughs> um, Absolutely not. It's not going to reflect well on me. So um, <laughs> that uh, that seedling sat in a little pot for most of the year um, and, and did okay. And um, at the end of the year, I had a bunch of um, bare root shrubs that came from Ed, you know, um, that never got planted. Um, and some of them were ones that I begged for and I never planted them. Uh, and so I, I, I wanted them to live. And so if I remember correctly, I chucked them all into this area where, you know, I normally grow vegetables, but hadn't. Um, and so it was basically a bunch of dead annual weeds there. So I chucked them in there and threw a whole bunch of leaves around them. And then, um, in preparation for this episode is walking around and I saw these plants (laughs) there and, and I'm like, I have no idea what any of these things are. Um, you know, a couple of them have labels on them. I know there was a Grolo sumac in there. And that you I had, begged me for. You right, begged right. me for that plant. And um, it wasn't until you mentioned this plant that I'm like, oh, yeah, I wonder if that's over there. That, that could be over there. But there are so many things around um, the various beds that I have that I look at and I'm like, what the heck is that? Right. I obviously planted that. There's, you know, uh, five of them artfully arranged, you know, um, so that must be something. I have no idea what it is. Um, no recollection of, of actually planting it. Um, yeah. So that's, that's where, uh, if, if your Helesia, uh, survives, um, it's, it's in and amongst those shrubs and those shrubs are just starting to wake up. Um, Styrex, but- Styrex, not Helesia. Styrex. <laughs> okay, the lesson we have learned here is that Ed is going to listen to this episode, Ed Ed Gregan from Bailey Plants, and he is never going to give us any plants again. No, he, we're, he we're is. Done. He is, because when we grow plants, we talk about them endlessly. True. Uh, and there, there have been a lot of winners uh, from Ed. And what we're really doing is we're really finding out just how tough these plants are. Uh, because, you know, once they make it through me, then then you can truly say that they're a tough plant. But yeah, I, I, I think I'm like a week or so behind you because you're closer to the coast. You're mm-hmm. a little cooler. You have a lot of things that are much more advanced um, th- than I do. Uh, things are just starting to break bud um, for me. So um, I, I can tell you another week or so. Fingers if, crossed. If um, if the Styrax is is amongst the plants, uh, you know, in the in the buried in the magnolia leaves, there. Um, I know one of them's an Exocorda. And that's that's doing fine. That popped out. That actually has a piece of landscaping tape that Ed wrote Exocorda on. Um, so that's how I that's how I know what that one is. Um, All right, I'll let him know that 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 was a survivor. He'll be happy and, with and, that. And apparently, that's a good way to mark plants because it had like dirt all over it, and you know, and I rubbed the dirt off the uh, you know the the landscaping tape, and uh, I could still read it. And there's one called Wildfire. I have no idea what it is, but it's cultivar name is Wildfire. Uh, but we'll find out. Good to know. See, I didn't want to answer that, but there, you you got the whole story. (laughs) So one plant that's just starting to break bud, like barely starting to to, um, show its leaves, but it it is um, showing enough life that I know it's coming back. And this is why I did not send a picture of it to you, uh, because you wanted pictures of these just emerging. And it's it really hasn't emerged yet, but it is about to. And so once we actually get uh, get some leaves on it that look like something, I'll send you a picture. Uh, but this is um, a Japanese clethra, uh, clethra barba nervis. Uh, the cult of our name is Takeda Nishiki. Um, and uh, if there's one, there's a lot of reasons to grow the native clethra. And I do grow a lot of those. They're a great plant. Uh, another reason to grow the native clethra is that it does not have cult of our names that are difficult to pronounce. So t- <laughs> Takeda Nishiki is... Uh, it's hard to say, it's hard to spell, and it's hard to sound cool when you're saying it. Um, and the native cultivars don't have that. So that's that's one reason to go native. But I didn't. Um, I grew this plant um, because it's a clethora, because it's it's easy to grow. It bulks up um, fast. Uh, wonderful smelling uh, summer flowers. Uh, and then this one has foliage that, uh, that comes out uh, green, speckled with white and pink. Uh, and it's just amazing. And it's supposed to get to be about ten to fifteen feet tall and wide, uh, which is which is totally what I want um, in this spot. May you know, may I live to see it? Um, right now, it's about a foot tall, but just a just a great plant. 
stunning every time I see it. I've never seen it that big, but it's it's always amazing. And I'm glad that I have it, and I'm glad that it it came back. It it, uh, it brings me joy. And I do want to take a look at it to see how the pollinators react to it, because I know um, the pollinators love the native uh, clethra that I grow. And I do want to emphasize that I do grow native clethra. So um, I don't want anyone to get mad at no me. Letters. Yes, no letters. No letters. No emails. I have, I, I have, I have several. Um, in fact, <laughs> all of the clethra I grow are native clethra. Except. Except for, except for this one. And so this is an exception. I want to see how the pollinators um, do with it. But no. just, just a wonderful plant. Yeah, go ahead. So so this was, wasn't this a plant that we ended up seeing at Quackengrass too? We saw like a, a pretty significantly sized one that was containerized. And it was really cool because in photos, you can't really get a scale of, you know, what the habit was, but it was really cool because it was almost like tiered foliage and it looked like it had been splatter painted with, yeah. you know, white on these green leaves with a little, you know, blush of pink on it. It was really, really cool. That that is what it looks like. I'll I'll take your word for it that we saw it at Quack and Grass because I think we did. Um, it, it sounds like something that they would sell, mm-hmm. and we saw so many cool plants there that it's they they all kind of blended together. Uh, I actually brought this one home from from uh, from Oregon. I was out there for a, for a plant tour, and Dancing Oak, Oaks Nursery had a um, had a table there. They're selling plants. Um, I got it. I grabbed it. I, I you know I nurtured it home, you know, on the plane. <laughs> and so it's it's special to me. So zones five to eight. This is um, it can take shade, uh, partial shade. Uh, Clethra is generally like a moisture spot, but none of the ones that I grow have ever gotten any extra moisture or in a very moist spot. Just a, just a wonderful wonderful plant. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, that mm-hmm. is a really cool looking plant. I think it, we recently featured it in a uh, regional page too. And yes. Uh, yep. Yeah. And it was just like the photo of it in the regional page just totally did it justice. It looked awesome. So that, yeah, if that one has any seedlings, feel free. Yes, I will move them about my, my, uh, (laughs) into other beds because it's just a wonderful plant. Yes. uh, All right. Well, they don't, they don't don't really reseed, but they do sucker. Oh, okay. I'll take a sucker too. I have tons of sucker off my Ruby, Ruby spice that uh, I needed to go. All right. Still feel free. Hello. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I don't think Ed would want any. I need to return the favor for all the plants that he's given me. So, <laughs> Well, listen, I'm going to talk about a um, a plant that I picked up at the plant sale last year mm-hmm. and uh, another variegated plant, and that is Snow Fairy Caryopteris, so blue mm-hmm. mistra, bluebeard. Snow Fairy doesn't look like any of the other Caryopteris. It is highly variegated, teeny tiny little leaves, this rounded shrub that's about two to three feet tall and wide. Really, really cool because usually September, late September, early October, not much going on in the garden. This thing throws up all these cool little blue spidery flowers all over it, which is awesome. And uh, I just, I liked it. It did not look good in a pot. And so we didn't sell a whole ton of them, but I got some of the leftovers and I chucked them up on my hospital hill. So full sun, really crappy, lean soil, mostly backfill from my foundation. This is an area that uh, I don't clean out. So it's covered in leaves. So when we were launching this topic, I had to go up on the hill and start digging around in the general vicinity. I thought these things were planted and lo and behold, the sticks are still up there and there's teeny tiny little purple buds coming out on it. So I think at least one of them survived, which is pretty remarkable. Um, zone six to nine. So it's a little less hardy than some of the other Caryopteris. And really, honestly, I just, I didn't take care of it. So I am shocked that this thing came back. And uh, yeah, no water, really dry summer. I just wanted to see if it would make it. And it's a really tough shrub, apparently, because it, it it's looking good so far. Yeah, you, you gave it the Steve treatment. Um, I did. Yeah. <laughs> I remember that plant at the plant sale. You're the one who made me put it on the list, as I recall. Mm-hmm. And I just thought that was the, no one's going to buy this. It's a terrible looking shrub. And they it's didn't. Be hideous. Um, that's true. But when it came in, I was pretty impressed with it. Yeah. It the- good looking shrub. I would have brought some home if somebody didn't buy them all bef- bef- in front of me. <laughs> but they, they, they were say very to, cool. They say to treat Caryopteris uh, like a perennial, and you're supposed to, you cut it cut it back. Yep. You know, at the end of the season, do you do that or do you leave it? 
I do on my other ones. I have um, a Worcester Gold. I have um, another one that its cultivar name is Jason. And I forget which one that is, like Bright Sunshine or something like that. So that's what I do with my other ones. I cut them down. But like I said, these ones are on Hospital Hill. So I didn't do anything to them. But it's where it's coming back is it's suckering from the bottom. And actually, I was pretty surprised. You'll see in the pictures that we post online. Uh The hospital hill actually eroded away, so there's exposed root ball around it, and this thing is still suckering up, so clearly pretty tough. Yeah. Now, now, if that were in my garden, I would uh, would have the same situation, but I would also step on it a lot. Um, (laughs) That's... um, just for good measure. Well, no, you just you just have to, to find out. And uh, <laughs> apparently that's a that's a trait that's hereditary because I had my son uh, in one of my beds trying to clean stuff out. And I said, just don't, don't step. I, you know, I showed him where all the stuff was like, don't step on anything. And I turned around and turned back and he's 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 basically, you know, killed a daylily um, by standing on it. And he, he felt bad. I kicked him out. Um, I said, it's not your fault. I do the same thing. Um, it's just if it's going to happen. Out. I, I just want it to be me. Like, if it's going to be me, I'll be bad at me. I uh, won't be mad at you. It's not your fault. The plants are everywhere. You can't tell them <laughs> from the weeds. You know, it's 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 not your fault, buddy. But I'll I'll take it from here. You know. But but apparently a caryopterus could stand up to that. You know, speaking of plants that are hard to kill, it's hard to kill a hosta. Um, yeah. And unless you have voles. True. That's and, like prime rib for them. Yeah. And so the voles got pretty much every hosta. Uh, I was growing in a certain area. I haven't been growing hostas because I have deer, you know, but I've been trying to tuck them in in little little places where the deer won't get. And so uh, a few years ago, I bought, actually two years ago, I bought a, a Fire Island hosta. And this is, you know, it's a, it's a hosta. You know, you know what hostas look like. Uh, just imagine that with gold foliage and red stems. You know, it's a, it's a medium-sized hosta. It's not one of the big ones like a foot tall, a little wider. But yeah, Fire Island has just gold leaves, just emerges uh, wonderful gold. It has a wonderful red stem, which is why I got it. When I bought it, it was a little plug. It was like like an inch tall. And mm-hmm. so I stuffed it in a container to ride out the summer, and I hoped it would bulk up a little bit over the summer. It didn't really. And I was surprised the next year when it came back and so I moved it and put it into, in, a, in a real spot where I needed a pop of color. And it didn't really give it that because, you know, in midsummer, it kind of fades to chartreuse. And this is not uh, one that had been cared for or did really well. So it just kind of sat there. And I really had, I had forgotten all about it um, until maybe like a, a week and a half ago when I was walking by it. And I said, what's that gold foliage? Oh, my God, that's the most beautiful looking weed. Oh, no, wait, I planted a, a, a Fire Island hosta there. And there she was sticking up from, from the ground, beautiful gold foliage. You can't miss it. And it's exactly the pop of color that, um, I need right in that spot. Super easy to grow. As long as the, the deer and the slugs and the voles leave it alone, it's just going to look great there. You know, once it pops out and everybody else, uh, gets growing around it, super easy to grow hostas. Everyone should have one if they have shade. Mm-hmm. And no deer and voles, <laughs> because there's there's there are cool ones out there. That's not just the green one and the green and white one. So yeah, exactly. There's some very very cool shade, uh, very cool shade plants. Uh, Fire Island hosta. I am psyched it came back this year, uh, and I check on it every day to see if it's grown. It is shocking because you sent me a fo- the photo of it coming right? out. It looked, oh my god, it was glowing. I mean, this yeah. is this is like on fire, Fire Island chartreuse i mean uh, and of course you know there's not anything going around on around it it was against you know the black dirt but yeah i was super impressed i'm like wow that's hey, that's hey, good take, looking take that back there's stuff going on around it i just didn't show that in the in the, in the image okay <laughs> no, no. No to... it, was, it was a barren landscape and this one hosta you, you can't just dis- <laughs> i i scooch things away so that it, it was better to focus the photo on but, just uh, for the photo, right? I can't, yeah, I can't believe you're dissing my design, but yeah, it's 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 so gorgeous that even I noticed it. Yeah, it was yeah. it was really stunning. I loved it, loved it, loved it. So that's gonna that's one that's gonna make my list for sure. I have a I have a gold foliage plant, and I'm not going to spend too much time on it um, because I think we talked about it in the plant delights episode that we had when we visited plant delights. It was a plant that I got from them, and uh, it's it's one that hasn't 
it didn't do spectacularly throughout the year, but I had hope because it stayed alive. And that was um, the Sundew Black Sea Comfrey, which is Trachystemon orientalis sundew. Um, so it's a, it's a comfrey, large, you know, huge leaves that are about eight inches long, kind of fuzzy and corrugated, gets really, really bright yellow in the spring. And then slowly, because it's a partial sun- shade to full shade plant, kind of fades to more of a chartreuse color, um, not as yellow. But the thing that was really shocking this year is I kind of forgot I put it in a dry shade spot. I think it wants a little bit more moisture um, within its zones. It's zone six to eight. But all of a sudden I noticed the flowers came out on it before any of the foliage. It sent up these fuzzy stems with all of these kind of pink and blue bell-like flowers on it. And I was like, I didn't plant Virginia bluebells. What the hell is this thing? And then two leaves emerged from the from the crown and they were yellow and they were that black sundew um, or that, excuse me, sundew black sea comfrey. And so I was shocked. I was like, wow, this is kind of crazy. I'm, I'm, I was really surprised pleasantly. And uh, it might even motivate me to put it in a more appropriate spot now with a little bit more moisture. Now, this is the plant that we both got the same plant, mm-hmm. correct? Yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, mine doesn't look anything like yours. Um, <laughs> and, you know, you post... Because it's dead? Well, no, you... <laughs> Oddly enough, no. Um, but uh, it's it's with all those other plants that I don't know what they are. And mm-hmm. it spent its life in the in the pot, and I never planted it. And then you know I stuck it in in uh, in amongst the leaves. And when you posted that picture, I'm like, oh, that's a great plant. Why haven't? Why, 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 where did she get that? And then it dawned on me, like, wait a minute, I have the same plant. And I went and looked at mine, and it's one green leaf right now. It's not yellow or gold at all. It's like one green leaf coming up from this thing and i don't know what what magic so it's not flowering no at least not yet there's there's one green leaf sticking off of it and i'm like well there it is you know and it, yeah. it ain't yellow um so that's ma- weird ma- ma- maybe it died in a weed that looks like that took its place <laughs> which is you know entirely possible but mine doesn't look as gold yours looks like super gold like like my fire island hosta yeah. does it's like that kind of gold and then those really intense looking flowers on it and i was um it was really I was, weird. I was, I, I was super jealous when I saw the picture on on Instagram. So you're welcome. And and now even more so to know that I have the same plant. It doesn't look anything as good as yours. I'll, yeah. I'll have to. Um, I posted it on the for listeners. I posted it on the Fine Gardening Instagram. But you know what? I'm going to throw it up on the uh, our new new ish Instagram page for Let's Argue About Plants. So go to our our ha- we are at Let's Argue About Plants. Right. That's our handle. Our Art, I whatever. I, I can't imagine what else we would have called it. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I'll throw it up there. But yeah, it's it's so weird. And I think I put it up there and asking people like, hey, take a take a guess what this is. And most people went um, with borage because it looks the flowers look very much like borage flowers. Those blue kind of star like flowers it was it's yeah, but the foliage awesome. didn't look anything like borage no like, no no it borage, didn't. you know yeah. i know i know uh, i know it was really cool great plant i'm gonna go out there with some uh some gold spray paint tomorrow <laughs> Get on <laughs> good, it. good plan okay now what when it comes to color we've we've established that i'm not very good um with color wardrobe anyway. or garden right it, 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 anything having to do with with uh with color um and uh, I'll get uh, I'll make that relevant in a minute. But uh, the the last plant I want to mention that uh, I'm excited that it came back is uh, is Stacky's uh, Summer Crush, uh, which mm-hmm. is Summer Crush Betony. Um, it's a it's a relative of Stacky's Humulo, which you may know. This is um, it, it it has a big mound of uh, of green uh, scalloped foliage. Um, they look like like teeny tiny little pallets with uh, paddles with with scalloped edges, um, and then in summer it sends up these big stalks of uh, bottle brush uh, flowers. That uh, humulo, it's um, it, it, it's in that color the, the the pink mauve lavender red purple color vortex, which I could never <laughs> wander through and and correctly name anything. But it's in it's in it's in it's over there. Um, it's not blue. It's not yellow. It's not um, orange. <laughs> yeah. And so that's one of the reasons why I like Summer Crush, because um, the flowers are, are either whitish pink or pinkish white. 
I got a 50 50 shot on, on, on describing them uh, correctly, but it's, it's basically the same plant, but with a, a, a different colored flower. And I was excited to get um, some of these from our plant sale and there's only one left. And so uh, I, I cherished it and brought it home um, and planted it and did my usual. I, I gave it, uh, I gave it the usual care in which I walked by it and would look at it and would hope that it would live. And that's all, that's all the care it got. And it came back. It's just this nice, Tom, I think it wants to be, these want to be evergreen. Um, they never really lose yeah. their foliage. So it's, it's this nice, uh, uh, this nice mound of, of green foliage looking great. Um, just waiting to, to send up its flowers that are usually going to be whitish pink or pinkish white. It's mm-hmm. going to be one of those two. Super easy to grow. Um, my humulo has started to seed around. I've got a bunch of seedlings on those. They look great in the summer, covered in bees, just the super easy perennial. Actually has no, no downside to it that I can think of. And I know I'm jinxing myself by saying that, uh, but just a wonderful plant. I was, ju- I was just really thrilled uh, that this one came back. So wait, so you said seed around and that puts up a red flag for me. Is this something that is a little aggressive and I'm going to be plucking these things out of every crevice and crack from here to Texas? After after um, three or four years growing it, there are two seedlings. Oh, okay, um, all right, and that's it's doable. wonderful. Yeah, okay, yeah, it's that's not, doable. It's, they're, yeah, they're they're not like rabbits, you know. They're like or, or voles, you know, that that are just constantly reproducing. Um, they're like I don't know, whatever produces like one offspring at a time, you know, in a very controlled okay. manner. Okay. <laughs> We, and, and, like and a they're, hippopotamus, they're, I guess. <laughs> a I don't manatee. Know. I mean, we, we we've reached the limit of my knowledge of the animal world, so I don't even <laughs> I don't even know how many young a, a manatee or a hippopotamus would have. <laughs> Apparently, you do. One. I don't know. A duck bill platypus? Like, I got nothing for you. I really don't. Oh my gosh! So this is a plant that didn't Brett. Brent Horvath from Intrinsic Perennials. I think this is his introduction. Could be. Could, yeah. Man, that guy does some awesome plants. And he really some, does. Some really hardy plants, too. I mean, he puts them through the rigors for years upon years upon years before introducing them. And, uh, yeah, Midwest. Yeah. So Yeah, it's, it's a good plant. If you ever see a plant that comes from Intrinsic Perennials, um, you, you know it's a quality plant. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I've got, I've got a couple of his. Uh, ginger. Uh, was it ginger love penicetum? Penicetum, uh, yeah. I have yeah. black hawks, which is yeah. um, uh, is that a blue stem? I can't remember. Black black hawks. Black hawks. It's a it's a, a Andrew, Andrew Pogon. It's a, yeah, it's, it it's is the big it's the big blue stem. Big blue, blue stem. stem. Yeah. yeah, great grass as well. Yeah. So, all right. So my end plant is something that I saw in the pages of fine gardening when I first started 13, 14 years ago. Really? Um, yeah. I think it's 13 years this year. Yeah. It hasn't been that long. It really no. has. No, it really has. 2007. Hmm. See, it just flew by, Steve. I'm, I'm, I'm getting old. <laughs> Everything blends together. Yeah. So anywho, this was something that I think was featured in one of our special interest publications in the Great Gardens, where we used to feature these kind of over-the-top gardens. And I'll never forget this photo. It was of umbrella plant, Darmera pelatata, pelatata, peltata. And it was in a giant pot in California. Don't make fun of my Latin. I see you laughing. You say peltata, (laughs) I say peltata. You know? (laughs) So it was it was this awesome umbrella plant that was in a pot, got huge. It was three to five feet tall, as wide, and they it was just really cool. And it literally looks like small green parasols or umbrellas, these giant leaves on these really, really tall stems. And I thought, oh man, that would be so cool. And it, it was just a photo that stuck in my mind. And then lo and behold, at the plant sale last year, we had that plant. It's not something that I've really ever seen at nurseries before, not in our area, at least. I'm sure it's, you know, popular out in California where it actually is native. So I said, I'm going to do it and I'm going to put it in a pot and I'm going to put it in partial shade, which I have very limited amounts of. And it likes moisture, which I have very limited amounts of. So I was very diligent about watering it. And I left it over the winter and said, all right, hopefully this thing comes back. And you, I left went it in the, to, you left it in the I, pot? 
I left it in the pot. It's a large pot. I would say that the pot is probably mm, three feet wide. It's like a bowlish type pot um, by maybe two feet deep. So it was a big pot, um, concrete. You know, it's, it's a it's a serious pot and kind of tucked up against the foundation of my house, which is where I've got most of my shade. And lo and behold, I went out for this, you know, to scope out what holy cow came back. And there's this crazy fist, this nubule thing coming up from the pot. And then I dug around a little because I couldn't help myself. And yeah, it's got these little almost fern-like fronds that are coming out from the base of it. It came back. I can't believe that. In a pot, like, I, I just, yeah, I'm shocked. I'm shocked and I'm so excited, which means, and it looks like it's masked out quite a bit because last year it was just like maybe three or four stems. And that picture I remember from, you know, when we, we featured it in the magazine, it was just chock-a-block full, you know, in that pot. So I, hooray! And, and Dar, Dar, Darmera Peltata is native to California? Yeah, apparently Northern California. Yeah. Okay, Northern California, okay. Yeah, Northern I, California. I, I think of that as, as something that loves moisture. Am I correct in that? Yes, moisture-loving, uh, shade to part shade. Yeah, so all the things I don't have. So I had no business buying this plant, and I have yeah. no business being excited. There's no reason. Out. There's no reason that plant should have come back. No, an anomaly. Um, some freakish, freakish, bizarre thing is happening here. Uh, it is, and it could yeah. have been because we had such a mild winter. I don't know. It could have been, but well, yeah. I'm, I'm, sh- I'm sure that helped. Um, yeah, but, uh, it's very X Filesy. Like, why did this come back? It's uh, yeah. It However, I back. I am in the zonal range though. It is zones five to seven, which I was really surprised about when I went and looked at what its zonal range was. Now, hmm. hey, I went on Missouri Botanic Garden, so maybe that's not accurate. But yeah, zones five to seven, which kind of struck me as odd. But yeah, holy cow, it's the ugliest looking thing when it comes out. I mean, it really is. It's like this angry fist, like launching out of the What would you soil. call it? Like a, a nobule? A little nobule thing? <laughs> yeah, I don't it's know. It's a new word. It's a new word. <laughs> And now, because everything sounds better with a British accent, here's Peter to talk about planning ahead. Ah, yes, the elation of seeing plants return in spring. It is truly one of the high points of a gardener's year. If you want to make sure to maximize the enjoyment you feel when one of your plant gems unfurls its first foliage of the season, then you have to put in some effort. An exuberant spring comes from the work you do in summer, fall, and winter. Many plant descriptions that boast of a plant's fortitude also include the daunting caveat, once established. This means, given a good start, most plants will take care of themselves. So getting those plants established means reducing stress on the plant, usually with sufficient watering in summer and sometimes into fall. In autumn, a plant prepares for dormancy by sending its energy back into the roots. If this energy is instead spent struggling for survival, not enough energy will be stored in the roots for the plant to survive winter and emerge in spring. In winter, a blanket of mulch will moderate soil temperatures, allowing roots to keep growing, even when the top of the plant is dormant. So, while some gardeners, like Steve, will spend too much time in the hammock, sipping overly strong cocktails and complaining about the ever-encroaching army of weeds, others will be tending their plants. And we know which group will be sad in spring, and which will be joyful. You know, Danielle, Peter takes a lot of shots at my gardening and that I can take, but he, he insulted my cocktails and I think that's over the line. I mean, I'm, I'm going to say that is over the line because I've had some cocktails that you've made and they're delicious. A little strong, but delicious. But it, it only takes one. Really? That's all you need. <laughs> that's right. You know what else we need? We need expert uh, testimony. Let's see who's coming up. Hey, podcast people. This is Joseph Tykonovich. I... I'm a contributor for Fine Gardening Magazine, write articles in the magazine sometimes, and you may have seen my goofy gardening cartoons on Fine Gardening's social media, and I've written a couple books, the most recent of which is called Rock Gardening, Reimagining a Classic Style. Um, And today I'm going to talk a little bit about things that came back for me this winter. Um, So for some context, I gardened pretty much my whole life in the Great Lakes region, Michigan and Ohio. Zone five, six ish, depending on where I was living at the time. And for the past two and a half years, I've been living in Williamsburg, Virginia. 
which is zone seven, almost eight. We can like see zone eight from my house. So it's been a, a huge change and a lot of cool things come back from the winter now. We had a really mild winter this past winter. I think the lowest temperature I recorded this whole winter was like 23 degrees, which is crazy. That's like zone nine or something. So everything came back. Uh, there's a few things that are really I'm really excited about and have had a lot of fun watching come back in the garden this year. One are the hippie eastrums. So the common name is amaryllis. And of course, I had always grown these as house plants. you know, those huge bulbs growing inside to force for those enormous oversized flowers. And then try to get to flower for Christmas and usually actually flower in January, February. And they're not all hardy uh, here in zone seven slash eight, but a, a, quite a few of them are. And a couple years ago, I got a variety called Johnsonii, which is uh, an old hybrid. It's a little bit flo smaller flower than sort of the classic uh, amaryllis that you might grow inside, but bright red flowers with a white stripe down the center of each petal. It's really beautiful, and it's been a fantastic plant. I started with one bulb. I've already divided it to like five or six clumps, and it's it looks fantastic. And there's something magical to this northern transplant gardening down here to see a plant I think of as houseplant and a tinder bulb growing so happily outside and see those you know, classic um, amaryllis leaves thing up out of the soil in the spring. It, it's just really, really cool. Um, and so I've added a few more varieties this year. Brent and Becky's bulbs, which is actually not far from me here in Virginia. There are several varieties that they recommend for outdoor planting in this climate. So I got a few of them that I've just added to the garden. I'm really excited to have those in the ground. Speaking of bulbs, I've been playing around with tulips. So tulips down here don't come back, not because the winter is too cold, but because the winter is too warm. And especially the summer is too hot and wet. Tulips like dry summer dormancies and cold winters to go through their full dormancy cycle and come back vigorously. So regular Dutch hybrid tulips are annuals down here. Like they do not come back at all. It's not like what I was used to, which was they kind of would peter out, but you would get a display for at least several years and some varieties would perennialize. Down here, it's like you plant them, you get one flowering the next spring and the next year they're gone. Um, so a couple of years ago, I started just trying to get as many different species tulips as I could because some of, the, some of the species tulips are supposed to be a lot better adapted to warm climates um, and mild winters. I got a lot of them from just regular bulb catalogs and also Odyssey bulbs, which I think is in Massachusetts. Anyway, Odyssey bulbs has an insane selection of wonderful, unusual bulbous plants. So I like just got every kind of species tulip I could find basically and stuck them in the ground. I've just been watching to see how, how they do. So this is the second spring for a lot of those, and a couple of them I've been really, really th thrilled with. My two favorites so far are selections of Tulip Badalinii, which has always been one of my favorite species varieties. It's a tiny, like, miniature little tulip. It's maybe, I don't know, four or five inches tall in bloom, but it's like perfect tulip flower. You know, it's like classic sort of vase shape that sort of stays closed, depending on the cultivar, yellow to sort of salmony oranges. I think there's even scarlet selections. Beautiful, very silvery, gray foliage. And it's come back, not just come back and flower, but actually multiplied. The number of flowers this year is about double what I got the first spring that they bloomed. So I'm really thrilled that that beautiful little plant is not just perennial, but, you know, didn't just come back, but is actually coming back and more. But the best for that has been a, a tulip called Vedinsky. I guess it's spelled V-V-E-D-E-N-S-K-Y-I. I don't know how you pronounce two V's in a row at the beginning of a name, so I'm just saying Vedinsky. Who knows if that's right? It's another species tulip, obviously. Maybe a little taller, six to eight inches, and for the size of the plant, I would say like half of the plant is the flower. Sort of absurdly huge, screaming scarlet red flowers. Uh, sort of classic tulip shape. Really beautiful. That great just like blast of color in the spring. And I'm thrilled because this spring, it's second spring, not only did it come back, but my single bulb that I had ordered um, is now a clump of like, I think it was four or five flowers. I mean, it, it's, you know, bulbs when they're happy, often they'll double each year, which can quickly become a big clump. And this thing is like quadrupled in a single year. I'm over the moon, just really, really thrilled with it. So that's something I'm definitely going to be adding more of and indulging a lot more um, in my garden. So when I moved down here, I first thought, you know, I'm not going to push the zones. I'm going to grow stuff that's hardy to zone seven because 
there's a mountain of plants that I could never grow before that suddenly are perfectly hardy here. So why would I have to go plant all the weird things that probably won't survive? And that lasted about five minutes, maybe. So of course, I have all kinds of stuff that's like probably not hardy here. And one group of plants I've been playing a lot with are aloes. I've grown aloe vera as a houseplant forever, but there's tons and tons and tons of really beautiful, interesting aloes with gorgeous foliage and some of them have beautiful flowers. And there's a bunch of them which are hardy-ish. There's a nursery called uh, Ethical Desert. I don't know what's ethical about it per se, or if there's a morally dubious desert out there. But anyway, Ethical Desert has this incredible selection of hardy succulents, including a bunch of aloes that they say many of them are, they're saying are like zone five or six hardy. Now they're out west somewhere. And for a lot of these hardy succulents, keeping them dry in the winter is the huge thing. So now I wasn't expecting a lot of them to be able to survive, not because of the cold so much as the fact that it's wet, 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 wet all the time. But I've actually been really happy with uh, quite a few of these aloes I've been playing with have come through uh, now two winters, actually. So I have aloe aristata, which is probably the most cold hardy of the aloes and these beautiful little rosettes. Um, the leaves are sort of ridged with white. It's, it's a gorgeous little plant. Bry and Eclonus have also come back and I added, I don't know, four or five new ones this spring that we'll see if they manage to survive as well. Because keeping them dry in the winter is so important for hardy succulents. I've given them sort of a raised bed with lots of gravel to sort of a pseudo rock garden type conditions to keep good drainage. And then actually over the winter to keep them dry, a friend of mine had like an old window pane, old glass window pane that I set up on cinder blocks and just rested over top of them to keep the rain off over the winter. It felt very clever. Um, it seemed to work really well. It kept them dry. It worked great through most of the winter until I think in February or something, a big windstorm they came and picked up that pane of glass and blew it over, and I got to spend a day picking shards of glass out of my garden, which was charming. So it seemed to work till it shattered everywhere. So I think next year I'm going to try some version of that with plastic. Or maybe if they've gotten big, I might divide some out and put some sort of in unprotected place and some under the cover to see you know, how they do if they're exposed to the full brunt of a wet Virginia winter. And who knows what a real winter down here will look like, because this last winter was ridiculously mild. So in the last, I am almost running out of time here, but the last thing I'm excited has come back are pomegranates, which is crazy to me. Who would, I just can't believe that I can grow pomegranates outside. Um, so I got two different varieties. There's a, a variations in hardiness there, so I searched for some of the hardier varieties, and they're leafing out and hopefully will flower and give me pomegranates for my garden this year, which is very, very exciting. So that's what's come back in my garden down here in Virginia. So Steve, I'm pretty excited to see what comes back from your garden of sticks, otherwise known as all the free plants that you didn't plant last year. It, it, just because a plant of mine came back in the spring, there's no, there's no guarantee it's going to survive the summer. So This is true, especially if it's you. 